<laughs> All right, where's right, so we're going to talk a little bit. You had two good questions. Um, the, on the engineering side, if an engine was capable of using kerosene as a fuel, but providing more power to fuel consumption ratio, and so. Torque is tricky because torque is a separate calculation, and that is going to depend on the specifics of how the engine is engineered and how the vehicle is engineered right. more than the fuel. Um, in general, things that are if you if you back away from torque as a specific application, well, just like about power. Torque. Yeah, forget about torque. I was just like yeah, throwing it out there. Just yeah, like, um, I mean you can look at it in terms of um. In, Fuel consumption ratios is tricky too. But you could probably get better mileage, but it, it's always going to come down to how many kilojoules per gallon. Right. If we're talking about electric fuel, and typically the heavier the heavier compounds in terms of molecular weight do have more. They do, depending on how they're set up, um, have more kilojoules per liter. Up to a point, but very quickly you hit a point where where they're solids. Like bacon grease has got more kilojoules per per liter than um, you know olive oil, but you can't use bacon grease as a fuel because solid fuels don't work as well in a in an internal combustion engine. And that's the same. That's the reason that kerosene can't really be used as a fuel it's because its vapor pressure is too low. Yeah at room temperature at operating temperatures and so you actually can't put it into the vapor phase easily enough to burn it uh, um, and so that's so it burns really slowly it, if you were capable capable of working around that somehow um then you might get more mileage better mileage by saying injector or something instead of a yes you would have to do something like that and even then you would probably need much larger Larger cylinders with a lot fewer RPMs, and that goes back to the engineering. And then it goes back to the engineering side. If, on a pure energy standpoint, you're going to get in terms of kilojoules per mole, the bigger the molecule, there's more kilojoules per mole, and there's more carbon bonds, and carbon carbon bonds, and carbon hydrogen bonds. It's just can you make it dense enough? Um, and then can you engineer it so that it burns at a or, and really, I don't think you could without basically you'd have to entirely redesign an internal. It wouldn't be an internal combustion engine. It'd be so different than what we know as an internal combustion engine. Um, it's possible. How about applying this to like hydrogen? So, so hydrogen has the opposite problem. It's not energy dense enough. Right. It, it's always a gas at room temperature and the operating temperatures. But you can't make it dense enough to actually get enough kilojoules per gallon out of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the storage of it itself is a problem. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So really, there's a part of it is that, that our system, and we're going to talk about this actually, one of the first things we'll talk about is um, petroleum distillation, um, petroleum refining. Um, but yeah, we we are as a society are based around using liquid fuels for the most part. We're getting away from that with with Teslas or EVs in general and charging stations that charge super fast. Um, but then you still have to. They, they're, there's still always going to be a market for liquid fuels because liquid fuels will transfer transport really easily. And they dispense really easily. Gas fuels are really dangerous to transport into fuel things, but from a, as a gas, and solids don't burn well enough. Um, and so that there's probably always, but it's just going to be a matter of where we get that. If we could get more of our energy from biodiesel, then it, that's a carbon neutral process because you're taking you're taking carbon that's not sequestered underground like petroleum. Um, you're taking carbon that was freshly pulled out of the atmosphere and then turning it back into a liquid fuel that you can burn. So your net amount of CO2 in the air from the whole growing fermentation, fuel production, burning is zero. Right. 
Um, and so there's there's going to be room, I think, for more biodiesel applications. I got into an argument that, with someone who said that that's not carbon neutral, though, if it's net zero carbon use. So it depends on how it, it is carbon neutral by definition, but what they might be saying is that you have to put more energy into it than you get out, which is true. Their standpoint was that if this carbon is burned from fossil fuels that you're getting out of the atmosphere, then it's not carbon neutral. That was their whole argument. I thought that was kind of red herring. <laughs> yeah, so if you it's not it's not decreasing the current amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. It is carbon neutral by definition because the plants can't take they can't make sugar out of carbon that they're not taking out of the atmosphere and we're not making fuel out of anything else. So it it, right. it is carbon neutral. It's not going to solve the problem. It would could keep the problem from getting worse. Yeah. That's what carbon you you act you're actually trying to decrease the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. That's actually carbon negative. If you can engineer a process to be carbon negative, then every time you go through that process, you're actually removing a net number of, of pounds of CO2. If they do it like they produce whiskey, if they just made a big old warehouse of biodiesel from carbon in the atmosphere, that's definitely carbon negative. As long as you don't burn it. Right. As long as you're not burning it. Like yeah. Whiskey, I'm saying. They, they just barrel it for. <laughs> it, it's that's carbon neutral until you drink it, right. and then it goes back to the same. It's as soon as you use it, you actually would have to sequester the product and never touch it again for it to be carbon negative on the life scale lifespan of the entire product. And there is some work to that. You, we just took all of the excess um, excess waste from growing corn and soybeans in the U.S. and just buried it instead of burning it. Then that would be carbon negative potentially. But there's no incentive, financial incentive to do that yet. Right. I mean, what are your thoughts on like a carbon or CO2 maker for CO2 green, maker? Yeah, for greenhouses. A little machine that so all that that is is just burning propane. Right. So that's just the same as running a barbecue. That's it's that's actually not gonna help. That's not helping anything. No. <laughs> it will increase the CO2 in your greenhouse to make your plants grow better. But you're producing CO2 to do that, and not all of the CO2 you produce is going to be taken up by plants. Right. Okay. I was going to ask is that liquid as we store it, or is that a gas? As we store it. As we store it, it's liquid. We store it as liquid propane, and then as soon as, and it's under a pretty big, pretty large amount of pressure. I want to say something like 20 atmospheres okay. um, in those propane tanks. And then when you, when you open them up, it vaporizes, its boiling point is around zero Celsius. Gotcha. So that's why you can run your, or sorry, zero Fahrenheit. That's why you can run your get your gas barbecue outside, even in the dead of winter here. You couldn't if you were in a place like Svalbard or something. If you're way up north in the in the Arctic, where it's getting down to negative fifty, you can't run a, a propane barbecue at that temperature because you would have to, you actually have to heat the propane tank in order to make it a gas. Mm -hmm. Which I guess once you got to start it, it might work, but. Yeah, I saw a guy at the gas station yesterday with a propane torch heating up the concrete on the ground, and it wasn't coming out, so I just started blasting the propane tank with the with the torch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, sometimes you just got to warm up the fuel. Yeah. Um, histamine. So, from a chemistry point of view, histamine doesn't really do much. It's all biological. It's all just the... Um, but basically, it's so histamine is a, is a part of a class of molecules that are referred to as chemical messengers, which has two classes, two subclasses, basically hormones and neurotransmitters. And there is, there is a fairly large Venn diagram overlap between the two. There's a lot of hormones are also neurotransmitters. A neurotransmitter just means it affects the nervous system. And a hormone means it's, it's in the circulatory system, not the nervous system. And so there are lots of molecules that do both, and histamine is one of those. It's a hormone and a neurotransmitter. Um, and basically what histamine does is it, it triggers your immune system. It, it is a stimulant for your immune system, which typically responds to, to trauma by increasing swelling and inflammation and can cause hives and things like that. It's basically just so it tells your body, your immune system, hey, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that we don't want in here. 
try and flush it out, try and kill it, get rid of it. Um, which, when you're actually in danger of being poisoned or something venomous is around, or is, is in your system, or you're sick, that's those are all positive things for the most part. It helps fight infection and things like that. Um, when it starts giving off false positives, is when you get stuff like allergies. Um, be, like a bee sting is not. It is a foreign toxin to our system, but the amount of venom in a bee sting is not life threatening, right? But your body overreacting to it can be. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so from a biochem point of view, histamine basically stimulates the, the immune system to the point where it can become dangerous. Um, and antihistamines basically get in the way. They either occupy the same active sites on the proteins so that even though there's a whole bunch of histamine around, not as much of it can get through, get its message through. Or there are some antihistamines that actually cause, they actually stimulate the processes to break down histamine. Um, and so, but those are, those are really important from a, from a Western medicine point of view, because we have, we basically have been so good at eliminating a lot of illnesses that we're seeing more allergies as a result, because it takes more than one or two generations of antibiotics um, for our immune, immune system to learn, it doesn't need to be on high alert all the time. Um, and that's one theory as to why allergies are more prevalent now compared to what they used to be. I don't know. It doesn't mean that we should stop immunizing people. Um, it doesn't mean that like, allergies in general are safe. It's safer to have allergies than it is to get seriously ill for the most part. Um, but it does mean that we also have this added issue when it comes to um, yeah, our everyday life. Um, you know, yeah. pe people miss the forest for the trees with that. That's, that's one I feel strongly about. People will say like, oh, well, you should just not vaccinate and get sick and then you won't have allergies. Like, yeah, but you also have more infant mortality. Um, so like they're, they're missed like, okay, yeah, allergies are annoying. And, and it's annoying to, that I can't send my kid with a peanut butter sandwich to school because there's a kid in his class that has a peanut allergy. Would it be better off if 10% of those kids were dead instead? <laughs> no. I'd rather deal with the allergies. Then I'll just build her the question. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a shock comedian, so I won't uh, I won't go down that route. He's in a logic comedy. <laughs> That's what he's into. It's <laughs> a lot of thought into it. He does. I will give Bill Burr that. He has some bad takes, in my opinion, but. That's, I mean, all comedians. That's their job. <laughs> um, let's see. When, and then the most relevant question, um, most, the most common substituents that we'll see in this class are going to be methyl ethyl and propyl with the side of isopropyl. So most of the things we see in this class and most of the things in the OCHEM in the real world, those are the most common substituents, branches that you see. Are going to be methyls, ethyls, and isopropyls. Um, in this class, we'll, you'll probably see a skewed re over representation of other types of branches, mainly just so that I can test you on them. Um, it wouldn't really work for me to write a, you know, if 30 percent of your problems on the of your nomenclature on the test had complicated branches. That's so that I can test you on complicated branches. It's not like 30% of the molecules we care about have complicated branches. Yeah. Most of what you've given us on the quizzes don't even really exist, do they? A lot of them now. Yeah. Or if they do, I don't know. I, you know, they're not super relevant molecules. A lot of them. But yeah, just make one up all the fly. I mean, we usually do that. Yeah. Some stuff on the side. Exactly. Exactly. Like, okay, on this question, I want to ask them about, I want to ask them to do a complicated branch. Let me make up a molecule with a complicated branch. Oh, I already used cyclohexane twice. I better make this one cycloheptane. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of that. Um, I have not graded the quizzes yet, but um, seems like everybody had a decent handle on what was going on. Um, Did you go over that last question I asked, the protonated, deprotonated enthalpy? So I didn't, we talked a little bit about enthalpy. Um, 
and it's less about providing enthalpy to the system. It's because it's always about changing enthalpy for the chemicals. Okay. Um, and so, but most reactions that happen that are spontaneous are going to be exothermic, meaning that they're downhill in energy in terms of enthalpy um, for the for the chemicals. And so, if we can get if we get a reaction to go backwards. But we're not usually changing the enthalpy, we're changing the concentration so that equilibrium favors one side or the other. Um, so it's that's a tricky question. Things things that will spontaneously be protonated will usually be that'll usually be downhill in enthalpy. Okay. Um, so it's all based on it's all based on understanding. Exactly. Exactly. And we'll talk more about it when we talk about chemical bonds here in a few minutes. Um, out of these, which is the more acidic compound? What did we come up with? Was this this was on the quiz, right? Yeah. And so in the way that you look at this is neither of these really looks, you can't really see a whole lot in terms of uh, resonance with these until you look at the deprotonated state. The deprotonated state for the molecule on the left looks like this, right? That negative charge can resonate into the, the ring structure here. We get a resonant structure that looks like. That looks like this. If we do the same thing with the molecule on the right, we get the negative sign in the same spot, which is a carbon. So out of these two choices, and there's no way you can put the negative sign in this position because we're always going to alternate atoms when we, when we resonate our charges around, right? So no matter what we do, we can't put a negative there. So then the choice becomes, is it better to have the molecule like this or like this? This one puts a negative. Both of them, they all have full valences. We have the same number of electrons in both cases, same number of charges in both cases. The top one puts the negative sign on a nitrogen compared which to the electronegative, which is more, more electronegative compared to a carbon. So that not exactly. So we would expect this one to be more acidic. I read a little thing that said it broke down how bond polarity can tell you which one would be more acidic. So having more protons near the donated hydrogen. Which yield you a more acidic compound than more protons away from it? So, more protons be the Um That's so resonance makes it so that there's more to it than that, because that would suggest that we could put a nitrogen right here, that would be even uh, more acidic. But it's, but, like, but it's not because you can't put the negative sign on that nitrogen, gotcha. because you have to alternate atoms when you resonate these around. In the absence of resonance, yes. Good. More electron density close to the hydrogen is going to make it less acidic, usually. Gotcha. And if you put something more electronegative nearby, that's going to draw electron density away from the uh, acidic hydrogen. Gotcha. But resonance flips that on its head gotcha. because you have to be able to put the negative on the more electronegative element. So, like, a good way to look at this problem would be to just like make it into its deprotonated form and then like look at the resonance. Exactly. Like, oh. Out of these deprotonated forms, which of them is more which stable? Which of them is more stable than the resonance? Right. Okay. And we, we can't really tell by looking at these, which is more acidic. Right, yeah. But you, if you look, and if we assume that both of them are roughly the same stability, then what we're really looking at is, um, is what we were just talking about, is the stability of the deprotonated form. Gotcha. 
All right. And this was this one was more practice with resonance, right? Which of these which of these is not a valid resonance structure? Or which of these? And that has to do with the same. This one actually is pretty pretty easy to see because it breaks several of our rules, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a resonance structure that either has too many bonds on that carbon, or you kick you broke a sigma bond and lost a hydrogen along the way. Neither of which is possible for a resonance structure. Right, so this one and this A and D are equivalent. They're the same molecule, just flipped over, right? And then B is a little bit trickier to see, but you can take this resonance structure and get this resonance structure by just bumping these electrons over. So as always with multiple choice questions on, on a test or a quiz, Process of elimination. Um, it took me a while back in, in high school to really put that together, but you don't need to get the right answer. You just need to eliminate all the wrong answers for multiple choice question, right? And a lot of times the fastest way to do that is just look at what's not possible. But as far as the answer, what is possible in this case? It, what is possible in this case, yeah. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about properties of alkanes now, and then kind of we're going to talk about their three-dimensional structure and how that affects how different orientations of their three-dimensional structure actually affect things like enthalpy. And we're going to look at it in terms of bonds. Um, for starters, though, basics. Uh, are alkanes polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. So would we expect them to mix well with water? No. Nope. Um, in fact, hexane, hexane or cyclohexane is what I used as our example in the separatory funnel last week in lab. Um, clearly did not mix well. Saw very clearly that we had separate uh, separate layers. Within the same functional group, though, what would have a higher boiling point? Why? Because it has like a higher surface area and it's just like a larger molecule. Bingo. So our larger molecules <laughs> are going to have, remember that everything, the difference between a polar molecule and a nonpolar molecule is, is um, the intermolecular forces, right? And so polar molecules in general, we expect them to have higher boiling points than nonpolar molecules. <laughs> but there was that last class of intermolecular forces that everything had. Who remembers what those were called? Yeah. Van der Waals forces. Everything had Van der Waals forces. And Van der Waals forces were those ones that were like temporary dipoles. So if we say we had a helium atom, it's got two electrons around it, roughly spherical shape, right? There's this, there's a finite chance at any given moment that you get both electrons on the same half of the, the sphere, right? Which a dipole moment? Exactly. It creates a temporary particle positive on the other side and a temporary particle negative over here. Well, if this is next to other heliums, those heliums, the heliums nearby now are going to have their charges are going to sort of instantly mirror that. Because we have extra, we have a partial positive over here that's going to pull the extra le the electrons that's that mm -hmm. side. So those temporary induced dipoles are present in everything, and the more electrons we have, the more of these dipole attractions we have. These more of these van der Waals forces we have. So the fastest way to remember it is if the types of forces are the same then your higher boiling point is going to be whatever has more electrons, which also tracks with whatever's got the highest molecular weight. So larger molecular weight means higher boiling point for the same types of forces. And since we're dealing, going to be dealing a lot with, with um, not polar, polar and nonpolar, we always want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. So if it was methane or ethane versus methanol, 
So ethane would be CH3, CH3 versus methanol would be CH3, OH. They're roughly the same molecular weight. But this one is one more. But different. this one has polar, has hydrogen bonds, very polar attractive forces. So if they're the same weight, whatever have, is the more polar molecule will have a higher boiling point. If they're the same types of forces, whatever's bigger has the higher boiling point. And there is a crossover point because like methanol has way more intermolecular forces than say candle wax. But candle wax obviously has a much higher boiling point than methanol does. That's because we start getting into a crossover point. Well, yeah, methanol has more attractive forces, but the fats, the fatty acids that are in candle wax are, you know, some sometimes if they're still triglycerides, then they're not really capable of hydrogen bonds. But it's just the fact that you wind up with these huge long chains. Um, and because if it's still the triglyceride, this is actually another carbon in ester rather than being a, a true fatty acid. Out of habit, I call them fatty acid because that's what they are when they're detached. Um, but the point remains is that if you get big enough, then that actually becomes more dominant as far as determining the melting point. So I'm gonna try to not ask you questions like this where they're, they're in that gray area where you've got these competing variables. Um, I'll try to make it so they're either the same weight with different forces, or the same forces with different weights. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Seem, seem reasonable? I was expecting something harder. <laughs> but I mean, it gets to the point where even, even I would have to look stuff up. Like, where is that crossover point? How big is it? Do you have to get? I wouldn't have to go start looking up numbers. And I've been teaching this for 10 years. This is also a good way to remind yourself um, those those numerical prefixes for butane and protein, propane. I actually, because it's really easy to mix up which one of these is four and which one of these is three, right? But we, we've all used propane grills or pro, you know propane camp stoves or something before, right? Propane is a gas at room temperature. Butane is not. Butane is the liquid that's in a lighter. So if you can remember that, that helps. Okay, butane's got to be bigger because it's a liquid at room temperature. Propane's got to be smaller because it's a gas at room temperature. So I, I use this idea to help make sure, especially when I was first getting used to doing this, I drew that connection early on and that was how I, oh wait, which one is it? Sometimes I would still have to go back to that, but that's a foolproof way to remind yourself on a test no, I'm not, I'm not freaking out. It is actually butane is four and propane is three. Meth, F, broke you. Um, if you've ever seen this phenomenon before, especially at gas stations in the winter around here when we have lots of water on the ground, it doesn't take much gas spilled um, before you start seeing that, right? <laughs> Uh, or in the top of keys, yeah. But you have that. <laughs> uh, well, so it's it's this is actually a really fascinating phenomenon because what actually happens is you're actually seeing it spread to being a layer that's only a single molecule thick. There's not a lot of attractive forces to keep these these alkanes in a droplet form, and so they actually would just spread until they're just spread evenly over the entire surface of the water that they have to, to spread. So that's actually why one of the ways that they contain oil spills is literally just by putting a ring of buoys that, are, that make a full complete circle around the spill because you just keep it from spreading out to be a single molecule yeah, thick. Because otherwise you could do something, if you spill the two gallons of gas in the top of keys, that's like enough to cover most of the marina in a layer, like about one or two molecules thick. Um, and so, and that's actually what we're seeing when you see that rainbow effect, that's actually the different number of molecules because the way that a prism works is by refracting light at a different index of refraction, right? And at a different distance. And it, as you spread this out to be a single molecule thick, it, you won't be able to see it really. 
But what will happen along the way is you'll get to a period when it's five molecules thick, and that refracts a certain wavelength of light. And then when it goes to four molecules th thick, that refracts a different wavelength of light, and three molecules thick, and two molecules thick. All of those are going to refract different wavelengths of light, and so you get this rainbow effect because it actually is acting as a prism based on the number of molecules thick that layer is, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Um, What's the term for how attracted a material is to itself? Um, attractive forces. I uh, there is viscosity. Um, surface tension is probably the one thing yeah. the most things with the most surface with the most intermolecular forces cohesion have the have the most yeah thank you cohesive forces most surface tension and the most viscosity are all tied to intermolecular forces we don't really rank things according to the strength of their intermolecular forces or how polar they are but we could that's just not an easy thing to measure directly so we use terms like cohesive forces or which is another word for intermolecular forces yeah so um, gas in this case would be more adhesive to water than cohesive to itself and it's not even that it's adhesive to water it's just the gravity pulls it down it's and then polarity there it doesn't have adhesive or cohesive forces so in which case it just spreads to find the lowest point gotcha. because of gravity in the absence of gravity this does, it doesn't happen when you mix water and gas. You just get separate droplets. Yeah. And, and the droplets of the gas would not really, they would not really look like droplets. They probably they would look like droplets, but they would not stick together nearly as well. If you've ever seen the videos of astronauts on space stations playing with water bubbles or water or globes, they can like poke it and then it comes back together to form a globe. If you did that to gas, you would probably just spray it everywhere because there's not nearly as much to pull it back into that globe shape. Now I kind of want to see that. <laughs> All right. Um, when we're talking about some, some of the other properties we're going to talk about about alkanes is even if they're the same isomers, um, they're going to have some different properties. The one of the most important of which is what we call the enthalpy of combustion, which is basically like saying the enthalpy of formation, but it's a lot of times easier. So enthalpy of formation is what we use back in Gen Chem, right? We go look up the values in the back of the book. It's really easy to measure enthalpy of combustion in a lab. So when we're comparing these um, alkanes, a lot of times we'll, we'll just burn them and see how much energy we get out rather than measuring the enthalpy of formation. Um, because that's extra math. So we can have this molecule, a, a, an isomer with the same molecular formula, same balanced combustion reaction. So these are this is two different isomers of octane. Um, you've got just octane here, and here we've got a tetramethyl butane. So it's still a total of eight carbons. But how, when we burn these, we don't get the same, we get close to the same energy, but not exactly the same. So why is that? The forces between the straight octane are layered, so they have more forces between them than the, I guess you can say, double hemispherical shape of the butyl molecule it's not going to be yeah there's yeah and if we it's count like we count the <laughs> number of bonds too so here we have yeah we we're still going to have a total of of um 18 carbon hydrogen bonds and the same i believe it's the same number of carbon carbon bonds one two three four five six seven carbon carbon bonds versus seven carbon carbon bonds so it's not that that in our different isomer we actually even changed the types of bonds we have. We change something else must be happening. And so it means that just looking at bond energies is not is not the, the most accurate way to look at these entities. You can 
estimate these enthalpies of combustion by saying, okay, well, a a carbon carbon bond is X kilojoules per mole, and a carbon hydrogen bond is Y kilojoules per mole. And we can say, well, there we're breaking seven of those, and we're breaking eighteen of those, and add up those numbers. You can do that. The enthalpy of breaking the carbon carbon bonds change if it's tertiary versus secondary. There we go. The the energy in a carbon carbon bond, not all carbon carbon bonds are created equal. And not all carbon hydrogen bonds are created equal. A carbon hydrogen bond on a tertiary carbon is different than a carbon hydrogen bond on a methyl group. You can assume it's less for a tertiary group. It depends. Oh, okay. We don't want to make that assumption. <laughs> Just for this example, it's less. Just for this example. So we have to get less energy out. By not by a lot, like by a eighteen kilojoules. Kilo this, kilo this one has more energy. That's it, this one. So this one is less negative. So we don't get as much energy out gotcha. from this bottom one. I saw the negative. One. That's good. <laughs> you double negative to yourself. <laughs> um, and so we. Can look at this. We can. We can take it to add another point in between. The going from a straight chain octane to dimethyl hexane to tetramethyl butane, we see a drop in energy each of those times. We get less energy out to make the same products. So that tells us that something about the secondary versus primary versus tertiary, or something else, is going on. Something about Taking these these methyls and putting them on the in the shape gives us different energy. Um, and this one got kind of, kind of out of order because I grabbed it from a different from a different slide. This is the beginning. This is a random quiz question answer. Um, so the point I want to make before I go back and talk about about uh, petroleum distillation is that these different conformers that we can have, which is the, it's a different three-dimensional configuration of the same molecule, is a different conformer. It's not an isomer, it's this, because it's still the same molecule, it's just twisted around differently. So you could look at one, two, three versus one, two, three. Those are two different conformers of the same molecule. They're both butane. What we're going to see here in a second is that these different conformers can have different energies. There's going to be one conformer usually that's more favorable in terms of energy. And those different conformers are how we're going to be able to explain these differences here. It's the forces in, in between this methyl group pushing on this carbon and this carbon. You don't have those same interactions when it's a straight chain alkane. When it's a straight chain alkane, you don't have those branches pushing on other branches. It's the branches pushing on other branches and the different way the different commerce are arranged that account for this difference in energy. So if we're going to draw these, um, the wedge and dash is our most common way to show 3D structure, right? We've used that before to show these 3D shapes, especially when we were learning about tetrahedral geometries and things like that. Um, the sawhorse is kind of like, it's just um, one way of showing that this, this diagonal line here is coming out of the board towards us. So this is one way of showing that the red hydrogens are, are out towards us and the blue ones are behind the board. I don't like that as well because it's not as explicitly showing 3D structure. You have to use your imagination a lot to see what they're showing you there. Because um, it could just easily be the blue ones coming out and the red ones going in. Right. So, but if you take this shape, which we can, should be able to visualize a little bit, you take this shape and rotate it, 
Now it's in the sawhorse configuration. If you rotate it further so that you're looking at this red line, if you're looking so that this front carbon is eclipsing this back carbon, that's what a Newman projection is. So a Newman projection, you're looking directly down that bond, which again, takes some getting used to. You do have to use your imagination, um, but it's a little bit more, at least for me, it makes a little bit more sense than the sawhorse projection. Right, so the Newman projection is going to be the way we can look at how the substituents attached to, the, to this carbon and and substituents on this carbon, how they're going to interact with each other. They're not directly attached to each other, but they can still push on each other. They both still have, have um, three-dimensional volume. They take up space. They're going to push on each other. And larger things pushing against other large substituents is less favorable. And so if I took that same molecule that we were looking at these, these same molecules look at the extreme cases here if i drew a newman projection of this carbon of this structure where i'm looking down that bond i'm going to have a carbon with three methyls attached to it right It's gonna bite me some more. It's that corner. Looks like that's open space I can use, but it's not. And then on the carbon that's in the back, so this is the blue one, that also has three methyls attached. These three methyls on the front carbon are gonna be pushing against the three methyls on the back carbon. And them pushing against each other creates sort of what's called a strain energy, where they can't be as stable as they want to be because you're, you have this big object sort of pushing these three red metals closer together than they would normally want to be. Versus if we do the same thing looking at that bond, you're going to wind up with. So we'll do the same thing. We're going to have a propyl group attached Yeah, propyl group. And then two hydrogens. And then on the blue carbon, H7. We still have two big groups that are going to push against each other, but we only have one big group per carbon, which means they can be arranged so that they're opposite of each other. We get a compromer. If it's this straight chain molecule, we get a compromer where we have very little of these molecules pushing on each other, of these substituents pushing on each other. The more crowded we make it, the more these substituents push each other away and the less stable the entire molecule is. Again, not by a ton, you know, 18 kilojoules out of 5,400, but enough that it's measurable, enough that we have to account for the difference. And the way we account for the difference is these large groups pushing on each other, which is what we call steric interactions. Steric interactions literally just mean big objects push away other big objects. So when things take away space and push other things away from them, that's a, called a steric interaction. Sometimes we just say sterics. The sterics explain this. When are you going to predict projecting something with full four single bonds? Or do you apply pi bonds? You can apply them to pi bonds, except if we have pi bonds, everything's trigonal planar. Right. And everything's trigonal planar, we just have to change how we draw them. 
So if we were looking at a Newman projection of say uh, two butene. So if we had two butene here, the Newman projection would look something like down the barrel of the middle. Yeah, you would have a hydrogen and a carbon, and then our back carbon. So if this is if we're looking at it from this side. And then we would have the same, except that these should be planar. And then the pi bond would then be above and below. We have pi bond here and the other face of the pi bond here. So we can draw the Newman projections for these. We don't usually see them as being as useful because every, if we have pi bonds involved, everything's already flat. So we might as well draw it. It's just as much imagination for a software. Exactly. It does make the point, though. Yeah. Which of these would we expect to be more stable? Because if we drew the Newman projection for this one, our two methyl groups are going to be on opposite sides. Right? So, so okay, less crammed. Less crammed. We're putting the two big guys next to each other instead of putting one big guy and one little kid next to each other. If you had, is that if you had uh, six people sitting in one row in an, on a southwest plane, and you had three adults and three kids, you wouldn't put three adults on one side and three kids on the other side if you're trying to give everybody as much space as possible, right? You would alternate the small object, the kids, with the large object, the adults, to show that everything, the adults can spread out a little bit more and the kids have more room to get. Is that rotating a pi bond or is that just shifting? That would, that would actually be two different molecules. We haven't talked about that yet much, but we can't freely rotate these because we'd have to break the pi bonds to do it. So these are actually two different molecules, the cis, 2-butene versus the trans 2-butene. But we do still see the same effect. If we burn cis 2-butene, we get less energy out of it than if we burn trans 2-butene by about 10 kilojoules per mole. All right. Let's, let's take our break. We'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about petroleum distillation. Now we'll come back to that later because we have we're doing distillation in lab. Um, so we'll come back and we'll do more practice with uh, new projections. Come back at eleven o'clock, please. <laughs>
to be able to do that as well. The lab today? No, it's not. It doesn't seem like it's as much as us. Disregard the numbers up there. Yeah. Yeah, just a distillation and then put in a fractional bond. That's two setups. Yeah. Okay. Recording the temps and times is really the major thing. It's going to be more of a cell thing. Yeah. So you think cells? This was the last class I made a game to. Wait, I should have put some fifty nine to make a map and put it on here. Except getting bagels and shit all the way to the fucking big wall. All right, so. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> right. I realized about 15 minutes before class started that my 20th high school reunion is this Saturday and I didn't have childcare or, and I haven't been to one before, but at 20, that'd be fun. Go see my high school friends again. I was trying to arrange childcare for this weekend on short notice. Um, all right. So the trickiest thing about these Newman projections is sort of, orienting yourself. It's remembering that this is a three-dimensional object. So there's a couple ways you can think about it. You can think about it like we're taking this molecule that's flat the way it's drawn, or these tetrahedral shapes, and rotating it out. I kind of think it think of it, it's easier for me to visualize if I think about the molecule as sitting in one place, and I put my head mentally in the board and look at it from the angle. So that's what this eye is supposed to represent is, okay, put your, your head in the plane of the board and look at this molecule from that angle. So that this carbon, carbon two, is in front of carbon three. And what is that going to do to your overall orientation? So if we start by looking at carbon two, the first carbon there, it's tetrahedral, right? One of the bonds is going to be straight into the board. That's the bond between carbon two and carbon three. The other three bonds are going to be roughly 100. They're going to look like they're about 120 degrees from each other, but really it's a little bit less because they're pointed out towards us. Right? So remember that your first three fingers, when you spread them out, are a decent approximation of what a tetrahedral shape is. So my forearm is the carbon-carbon bond, carbon two to carbon three. Then the three things that are attached that are pointing out towards us are my three fingers here. So in this case, we're gonna have, if we were drawing these really to scale, then I might, 
I might even show this as a wedge coming out towards us. And then this one is a wedge. What's the one that's behind the bromine? Hydrogen. Just the hydrogen. Or is it dash instead of the wedge though? Not the way it's drawn here. Okay. All three because now all three of them are pointing out towards us. And here's our methyl group. Right, I say methyl group, it's not a methyl group like a branch, it's a methyl group because it's a CH3, but it's part of our main parent molecule. So carbon three then is the one that's behind, and it's generally going to be still in the same general shape, except we're usually gonna have it rotated about 60 degrees so that we don't line up with these things directly on top of each other. So straight up is going to be the methyl group. And really, if we're, if we're trying to use the wedges and dashes here, these, would be, these ones would be dashes. And the bromine would be down and to the right. And then what's behind the bromine would be the hydrogen again. And it can also be helpful to draw in your hydrogens on your first molecule too. So if we, we have the hydrogen going straight back into the board, if we rotate our point of view so that we're looking down, now the hydrogen is up and to the left on the purple carbon. So it takes a little getting used to, but this is that same molecule rotated so that these three are facing towards us. And if you wanted to do, take that approach, use your, your fingers, you can paint your fingernails different colors so you can keep track of what's what. You can write bromine, hydrogen, CH3, and then when you take it and you point it out towards you, it should maintain that same orientation, right? So if this finger is the bromine because it's up and out towards us, when I point it out towards you now, this is the bromine now, and it's up and to the right, which is how we drew it here, right? So it takes practice to visualize this, but it, it should start to feel fairly consistent, even if you struggle with it a little bit at first. And, and I'm being totally, it was kind of a joke, but kind of not a joke when I said paint your fingernails different colors so that you can keep track of things or just write A, B, and C on your fingernails. And that way you can say, okay, B, here's A, B, C, here's B. B is my up and out substituent. And now it's up and to the right. Mentally, Mentally paint your fingernails works too. <laughs> They're already labeled. If that, yeah, if you if you test. showed up, if you wanted to do this on the test, if you wanted to on the test write A, B, and C and Sharpie on your fingernails or paint them different colors, I'm not gonna tell you you can't do that. <laughs> paint it with ink, dab it, right on the page. <laughs> so if this is the conformer that's drawn, <clears throat> we could take the same conformer. And we can rotate, we can hold the red substituents steady and we could rotate the purple substituents because these sigma bonds can all rotate, right? So we actually can take this and twist it 120 degrees to see if we get a different conformer. What would it look like if we took this, if we rotated the purple ones 120 degrees? Methyl top right, bromine top left. So that would be the equivalent of we, the way we would draw it would be like that. We're saying we're rotating this front piece in that direction. So then that would put the bromine, we would, and typically you don't have to do it this way, but usually it's easier to um, keep one of your carbons steady 
and rotate the other one. Don't try to rotate both of them at the same time. So I'm going to keep all of the red ones in the exact same position where they already are. And then the purple ones, the bromine was up into the right. If we rotated it 120 degrees, now bromine is up here. This is the hydrogen, and this is the methyl. Would we expect that to be more stable or less stable? More uh, or the same? Uh, uh, the same. I would say maybe more stable. more stable because there's like not as much large molecules cramming it onto one side. What's the biggest thing in um, of all three of these substituents? Both of our carbons have the same three substituents, right? We know that the hydrogen is going to be the smallest substituent. Mm -hmm. Out of the other two, is bromine or a methyl group larger? Bromine. And why? Because it just the more, <laughs> more electrons, more energy levels occupied. Think back to your atomic radius back when we first did periodic trends. Higher, yeah, higher, higher radius. Exactly. So higher atomic radius for the bromine compared to the carbon. So we'd expect the bromine to be bigger. Here we've got the two methyl groups opposite from each other. So that's limiting how much they can push on each other. But we've got the two bromines right next to each other. So they're still going to be pushing on each other here. This conformer has our two largest groups opposite from each other. And that's what we call anti. They're in the anti position. So there's a couple terms. Both of these are, are what are called in a staggered configuration because we have them set so that they're not directly running into each other. If we set them up so that the two bromines were directly on top of each other, we would have all, all six of our substituents would be at the same three spaces, right? We call that eclipsed. So eclipsed would be if we had it so that the bromine and the bromine were on top of each other, and the methyl, that would put the yeah. So that's this is eclipsed because we have them set up. So I have to give them a little bit of space between them to draw them so they're not directly on top of each other. But really, eclipsed means that these two bromines are directly on top of each other. And this hydrogen and this methyl group are directly on top of each other. Versus this configuration, we call staggered. So you're just sort of alternating so that you have um, you know, one substituent in the empty space between two other substituents instead of directly on top of each other. It would still be eclipsed if you were to do the opposite way, right? Where I mean, I'm right. Thinking. So there are three different eclipsed configurations that we can have. And there are three different staggered configurations we can have. <laughs> We can have bromine eclipsing bromine, or bromine eclipsing a methyl group, or bromine eclipsing a hydrogen. And we can have them staggered where the two bromines, where the methyls are anti. We can have it staggered where the two bromines are anti. Or we have to have it staggered where the two hydrogens were anti. For the eclipsed. What which of the eclipse would be most stable? Is it when the bromines over the hydrogen? Hold, hold that thought. Okay, so let's talk about staggered first. <laughs> because it's just because there's one more vocab term I want to say. Um, so if you're in an, in a staggered configuration and you're talking about two substituents that are opposite of each other, that's anti, right? 
But this configuration, the two bromines aren't anti, but they're also not eclipsed. So this, when they're sort of adjacent to each other, but staggered, we call that gauche. G-A-U-C-H-E. Okay, so what is it? Is it when the two substituents are staggered right, right. next to each other on the same side? Correct. So we're always going to use gauche and anti to refer to two specific substituents. Like we can say the two bromines are anti, but the two methyls here are gauche. On this one, the two bromines are gauche, but the two methyls are anti, and the two hydrogens are gauche. Gauche is an interesting word. Does anybody know what it means in pop culture? Gauche means like, like garish. It means like ostentatious. So I'm not sure how. I don't know what it means. It's like gauche is another way of saying like somebody's new money or they're showing off their money too much. They're gauche. It's like in bad taste. Gosh. Gosh. But not, but not like in the restrained old money way. It's in the like, let me show off my money. Right. Huh. Um, so I have no idea why it shows up in OCAM, but um, yeah, I'm not going to speculate off the top of my head because there's a lot of different ways you could go with that. All right, so those are the four big with these Newman projections and these conformers. Those are two the four biggest vocab words for today: eclipse versus staggered, anti versus gauche. And so here's more figures showing staggered confirmation versus eclipsed confirmation. And so this is just for ethane. So ethane just looks like looks like this. And in its most stable state, it's going to be staggered, meaning that these Hydrogens that are in the same plane, the carbon hydrogen bonds are in the same plane, are pointed in opposite directions. Because if I drew it, so this is the staggered configuration, the eclipsed configuration would look like this in our standard wedge and dash notation. Right, because that puts these two carbon hydrogen bonds in the same plane. So they're flat relative to each other. So that's going to look kind of like this. If you rotated this, I drew that one, rotated 180 degrees. But you can see how naturally they're going to want to be in a staggered conformation because that makes the most the use of the most space. Right, that allows them to sort of avoid each other more and minimize those steric interactions. So if they, we have two different states, in this case, we only have two states. Right? Because we don't have to worry about anti versus gauche for anything or any other sterics. All of our substituents are identical on both sides. If all of our substituents are identical on both sides, we only have two confirmations, staggered and eclipsed. And in general, eclipse is going to be higher in energy. And if we look at that energy, so if we say that this is zero degrees, these are right on top of each other, that's going to be higher in energy. When we get to the highest point of steric energy, right? steric, yeah. So we're not talking about any reactions happening. We're just talking about the molecule rotating. Oh, okay. Over. So just steric energy. Just steric the energy that has. Right, because the rest, everything else is identical. Yeah. Right. Between the staggered versus the eclipse, they have the same bonds, the same carbon-hydrogen bonds, same carbon-carbon bonds. So the only thing different about these two conformers is the sterics. Because it has a full string. Exactly. So if we took this eclipse, eclipse confirmation, if we rotated the one in front 60 degrees, now we get a staggered confirmation, which is lower in energy. What if we rotated it another 60 degrees here? Back to eclipse. 
eclipsed, right? <clears throat> so basically we wind up with this sort of sine wave shape in the energy when it comes to rotating these, which kind of makes sense because sine waves come from rotating a circle, right? That's the, one of the original definitions of unit circle. And so we see that it's just going to be, it's not gonna just cycle once in two pi rotations. It's gonna cycle three times in two pi rotations because you're gonna hit three maximums if you rotate at 360 degrees. And you're gonna hit three minimums along the same way, right? So maximum, rotate 60, minimum, rotate 60, maximum, rotate 60, minimum. Just rotate because of the amount of substituents that are in there. Just system. because there's three substituents. So we'll have three maxes, three minimums. Exactly. Exactly. And so this is why these Newman projections are such a useful way to think about it. It's kind of like your unit circle. Think about it in terms of rotating around. Keep one of them the same, keep, and then rotate the other one. And you start to see these cyclic patterns emerge. With the ethane molecule, is it okay to visualize the hydrogen to carbon bonds that aren't dead or... Um, are they parallel to those hydrogen to carbon bonds? The these ones? No, the, you're you're drawing up to the right here. Yes, that hydrogen carbon bond, that one to the top left. Are those yes. parallel? Those are in the same plane. Okay. Yeah. In in so that's going to be in our eclipsed confirmation. That's those. They're 180 degrees from each other, right? Okay. <clears throat> and. This one and this one are 180 degrees from each other. Got it. Okay, and then those are 180 degrees from each other. And then on the other hand, these would be perpendicular to each other. Going these would still be in this. So perpendicular, the trick with the word perpendicular and parallel is that they're referring to two dimensions and we have to think in three dimensions. Right. I'm just so we would say two they're, these two are coplanar. They're in the same plane. Mm -hmm. But in the rotation between them, if you think of uh, my left hand being this carbon hydrogen bond and my right hand being that one, but they're like this, right? So they both have their own plane. Hydrogen, carbon, carbon is in the same plane and carbon, carbon, hydrogen is in the same plane. If we, the angle between those is what's called the dihedral angle. So when the dihedral angle is zero, that means that they're either totally eclipsed or totally staggered. They're either anti or they're 100% eclipsed because it means that your angle between your planes is zero. <laughs> so parallel and perpendicular are not quite. We've got, yeah, we use, we use planar or coplanar, um, or we talk about dihedral angles as being the same. Just thinking about two of the atoms, though, just just the two bonds between like this uh, wedge on the left side and mm -hmm. the hydrogen going up. Just those two bonds. These two bonds. You mean like that? Yeah. So that's going to be this hydrogen and this hydrogen. Or sorry, uh, this hydrogen and this hydrogen. Got it. Okay, so and those are going to be sixty degrees off from each other. Okay. Because actually, sorry, I circled the wrong one. This is this is our staggered confirmation. I see where you're going. Or sorry, our eclipse confirmation. I see what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it was not making sense when I was trying to. Look at it. <laughs> I was trying to think of it like a staggered, but it was actually eclipsed. It won't ever make that ninety degree. It would always make the sixty. You know, work. You, so you have to go. You have to go through ninety to get from negative sixty to negative one twenty. Right. But it's not necessarily going to be a clean one because we're dealing with three sixty divided by three, not three sixty divided by four. Right. In order to get ninety degree angles, it would have to have four substituents. I was just talking about the different molecular geometries. That right. Like. Exactly. Yeah. Are there new projections of like halogens or? Maybe when you, you can do this with any of them. Um, it's most useful for tetrahedral shapes because you don't need to do it really like we talked about before. Trigonal planar, it's not all that useful. 
because everything's stuck in a staggered confirmation or an eclipse confirmation all the time. And it's not really all that useful for linear because it's a straight line. Why bother? Um, and when you get bigger than that, you can use it. Um, we just don't usually build larger molecules off of something that's that's um, trigonal by pyramidal or right. that's not going to be your point. Exactly. To identify that. Exactly. It's a good way of phrasing it. Okay. All right. So here's that that shape I was talking about. Here's if our dihedral angle between the two these two red hydrogens, if the dihedral angle is zero, they're perfectly eclipsed, and we get a transition state. So, and this is what I was talking about when you were talking about what's more stable. Eclipsed confirmations will never actually be stable because for something to be stable, it has to be at the bottom of a potential energy well. The question was between the eclipse with the bromine over the hydrogen. Yes, and, and so those, we do take the account into their, how, their relative heights. We wouldn't call them stable though. Be just because that phrase or that word specifically means it has to be a potential energy minimum, a yeah, local yeah. energy minimum. I say more significant of the eclipse confirmations or the higher energy of the eclipse confirmations. Yeah. Right. So because if you and if you think about it, this is one of the reasons why in, in calculus you study curvature and concave up versus concave down and maximums versus minimums. Is because the fact that this is concave down is really important because it means that if if you visualize trying to put a marble on the top of something that's concave down, it can't stay there, right? So that's what I mean by you can't have something stable in an eclipse confirmation it's by definition. Gonna, the energy is just going to want to go down to that lower potential energy just by default. Just by default, and in which direction it goes is a probability game. Too. It yeah. could go if we if we give it a zero inertia and we put it right square at the top, there should be a 50-50 shot if it's symmetrical. But if it's not symmetrical, then it might be a weighted at average. Which way does it go? Is 70% of the time it goes left, 30% of the time it goes right. But either way, it will never stay stalled on the top. So my question was more, which of the eclipse confirmations had the lowest potential? And it's the same, it's the same um, logic yeah. for which of the staggered confirmations is more stable. It's the one that, where you put the, where your biggest ones, your biggest substituents, um, your most stable confirmation is when your biggest substituents right. are anti. And your highest energy transition state is when your biggest substituents are passing each other or eclipsing each other. Is it, would that be, did you consider that Gauche eclipse or is that not good? That's not really a term we would use. We would just say eclipsed. Um, and we would just change the so phrase. We would say that the methyl is eclipsing the bromine. So if it all has the same stuff, you don't have to determine as Gauche or. Correct, because we can't tell the difference between the difference this hydrogen and that hydrogen. Yeah. Um, we only, and that's why we get such a nice symmetrical sine wave looking function here. As soon as one of them is different than the others, if then if we took this ethane and we made it propane, well, even propane is still symmetrical. If we took ethane and made it butane, now all of a sudden we've got an asymmetrical potential energy surface. So for butane, um, two, two uh, pentane. Yeah, and so. We actually wind up with something that looks kind of like a sine wave superimposed on a sine wave. It's still repeating, but now you've got it repeating every 360 degrees with additional sort of sine wave in between. It's like a Canadian. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so our lowest energy state is when our biggest objects are anti. And when we rotate that, we wind up with methyl eclipsing a hydrogen and a methyl eclipsing a hydrogen, and then these two hydrogens eclipsing each other. So that's a, a potential energy maximum. So it's in a, a uh, transition state. And then we wind up with our two methyls gauche to each other instead of being anti. So that's actually slightly higher in energy because those two methyl groups push on each other. And we can measure it. 
it's about about four kilojoules per mole higher in energy than when they're in the anti configuration. And if we continue rotating, now we get through that higher highest of the high activation energies because this is the one where the two methyls have to go eclipse past each other. And then when you do that, you wind up back in the same position again because now it's symmetrical again. It's still the two methyls gauche. So these two energies have to be the same, right? Because we have the same I mean, types of interactions. Same, it's the, yeah, it's just the same thing, but kind of just flip like the chiral, I guess. It, yeah, so it, it is the same molecule just flipped, but for the sake of, of this graph, we'll, we'll think about it as, as though we could tell the difference between those two states. So we're keeping the back one fixed and rotating the front one. And then go through another transition. This is another lower transition in state because we have methyls eclipsing hydrogens, not methyls eclipsing methyls. What would, what would cause a change like that with your marble example you said marble at the top is going to roll down but what would make it go uh, what would cause that difference so the natural natural vibrations just from temperature so we can actually see these so this is a an ongoing equilibrium process where the equilibrium constant between this conformer and this conformer is based on that that 3.8 kilojoules per mole remember this equation the delta G for this process is just that four kilojoules per mole. So it's really small barrier compared to a lot of things. Anything up to about a hundred kilojoules per mole as an activation barrier, um, we can say it happens pretty readily at room temperature. This is only 16 kilojoules per mole for the activation energy. So we know it happens pretty quickly at room temperature. And there's just going to be an equilibrium constant between these. Um, if we cooled it down enough, we can actually get it so that everything stays here, where we lock it into the lowest energy conformation, because we make it so nothing has enough energy to make it over that barrier. On the other hand, that if you maintain a certain temperature to get an intermediate, what is it? Is that Right yes. Yeah. So at, at any given temperature, every temperature will have a different equilibrium constant for these two. And as the temperature drops, the more it will favor the lowest energy state. And the more the temperature drops, the slower the reaction happens because fewer molecules have enough energy to make it back and forth. So if you think about the, the analogy I always use is you put a bunch of ping pong balls in a, in a cardboard moving box. And we say that the reaction is one of the ping pong balls pops out of the box. You can say that the reaction happened. Okay? If I don't shake it hard enough, it doesn't matter how long we wait. None of those ping pong balls are popping out, right? If we wait an infinite amount of time, then maybe some of them would. But who wants to wait? But who, wants, who has time for that? <laughs> um, so if as we cool things down that's going to affect both rate and the equilibrium constant for that reason but at room temperature this is happening constantly and at room temperature you've got all of these stable states at any given time just in the proportion that's governed by equilibrium would it be flawed to think that like pass? I mean, this would just burn, right? It wouldn't like above it. If you did it in an anoxic environment, you so if you did it where it was just butane, you could heat it up really, really hot without it decomposing because it, the, when it actually burns, you need the oxygen. There will be a, a state where you, where you know other reactions could start happening. You could wind up with it one butane reacting with another butane or the butane molecule itself just splits apart into constituent atoms. Um, but that's, that's, we're talking really hot, but there is a theoretical maximum. When you get to the point where something becomes a plasma, that's when there's enough kinetic energy that the electrons are no longer bound to the nuclei. The, there's enough kinetic energy at the molecular level that the electrons can just fly around wherever they want. 
because there's no, there's not enough attractive force to overcome the inertia. So that's like a satellite having escape velocity. So it wouldn't even really matter if there's an eclipse to confirmation. Right, because so you don't have a molecule at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so we are being rather Earth-centric with our temperatures here, um, but that's fair because we don't really have butane in the sun, even though we have carbon and hydrogen in the sun. The sun is high enough energy and compressed enough that you wind up with everything just sort of being independent molecules or independent atoms instead of forming molecules. <laughs> So is this all um, entropy changes? Because you know, like delta G is enthalpy and entropy, but correct. So we, we're kind of simplifying by leaving off the entropy term because if we if we're not changing the number of molecules and we're not changing the states of the molecules, then we can we can assume that we have roughly the same amount of entropy in both of these states because we didn't break any bonds, we don't have any additional molecules and we don't have any phase change. We're ignoring any phase change. So, but yes, entropy does play a role if we have a reaction happening where we actually get more molecules on one side versus the other, or if we have a phase change happening. That's the, there are some reactions where we wind up with the same molecules where there's a slight change in entropy from, from reactants to products, but it's usually gonna be pretty insignificant if we have that, um, unless we have that change in number of molecules. This graph would be severely affected if we said that, what is this, butane mm -hmm. is a gas, right? If it's a gas. We are assuming it's a gas for doing this because. Okay, so on the other hand, if it was a liquid, it would be. We don't have a ton of other interactions happening because it's nonpolar, so there's all van der Waals forces, only van der Waals forces. But yeah, technically, there's other butane molecules floating around in here too, that are gonna be interacting with it in this process too, if it's a liquid. We're neglecting that because we're saying that those are gonna be less, the intermolecular forces are less important than the steric interactions happening. And we do that a lot with organic chemistry where, where unless the solvent is playing an active role, like there are some reactions where you need your solvent to donate a hydrogen at one point. Um, and we'll have one of the steps in the mechanisms. But in general, we make the assumption that we're, we're going to treat most of these reactions like they're happening in the gas phase because there's not that much um, difference about gas phase versus liquid, and liquid makes things so much more complex. So temperature change in a liquid creates a less entropy in the system, right? Temperature increase in a liquid would create less entropy, right? More, more entropy. So is it opposite for gas? More temperatures, less for less entropy. So unless there's a phase change happening, the entropy is not really changing. The entropy portion of a reaction can become more significant. I'm thinking temperature and entropy between the uh, liquid and the gas are the same. So oh, okay. So if we had to say butane as a liquid. Yeah, yeah. And then butane and gas. Yeah. So which of those would you expect to have more entropy? The liquid. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you have more degrees of freedom because you have more empty space as a gas. Yeah. So gases are higher entropy than liquids, and liquids have more entropy than solids because liquids are still stuck close to each other, but at least they can move. Okay. And, and solids have the least entropy. Um, and in general, because of this, this T term, even if, if we can make the assumption that the delta S for this process is the same at all temperatures, it's a reasonable assumption. It's not strictly speaking true, but if we say that delta S is the same at all temperatures, then what really winds up changing when you change temperatures is just that. As your temperature goes up, the second piece here, this T delta S term gets bigger and therefore more important in determining whether something is spontaneous or not. So at higher temperatures, entropy matters more. And looking at, we're going to, we're going to um, the, in this case, K is gonna get bigger as temperature goes up because K has that delta G term in the top. 
and t in the, is in the denominator, it gets more, it's slightly a more complex function than just an exponential or even just a fractional exponential. Well, just because your delta G is in the, in that exponent as well. Right. Delta G has a temperature term in it. So if you actually uh, write that out, we get E to the negative everything. delta X minus T delta, or my delta H minus T delta S, all of that over RT. So you have temperature in two places in an exponent with a negative sign. It's a real complicated function when you start looking at it, but the general gist of it is as temperature goes up, you're gonna you're gonna even more strongly favor the side with higher entropy. Now exactly how much you favor it, that's gonna depend on specifics, but that's a that's an absolute. Yeah. Entropy becomes more important as temperature goes up. Yeah. And as temperature drops, delta H is more important. I'm thinking about entropy as like the characteristic when it's more of just how, how we measure. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's disorder. How many, the true definition of entropy is how many different possible arrangements are there? Microstates. Microstates is what they call them. Right. So the, the actual, not delta S, but just the definition of S is Boltzmann's constant times natural log of W, where W literally is the number of possible microstates, number of possible arrangements. So, and I think there's a negative in here too, but yeah, it's all over. Um, <laughs> but so, so really that's all, that's why gas is higher entropy than liquid is literally there's just more space to arrange stuff because you've got more empty options. Yeah. There's Another good example is how many different ways with this classroom, how many different ways could I arrange for students? A lot just more than lot. just having how many seats there are, yeah. you know, divided by four, probably close to it. But if there's if every seat, freedom. yeah, if every seat is filled, or if there's if there's only four seats here, that's like a liquid. If I say, okay, you're looking the four of you have to sit in the seats and there's only four seats, there's only so, so many ways I can arrange you, right? And then a solid what, in a solid seat, seat, like you have to sit in the <laughs> same seats and you have to sit and you can't even switch seats. So you can't like there's you're only one arrangement basically. Not sitting in the same seat. Right. <laughs> um so it, that's a worthwhile. A bit of a digression, but a worthwhile one because we're going to keep coming back to that concept as far as will this work better at a low temperature or a high temperature, for instance. And it always comes back. This is also this equation right here, and the idea that you can apply this to a phase change is exactly why physicists make claims like chemistry is just applied physics. Um, they're not wrong, but they're they're neglecting the fact that we actually take into account all the variables instead of the ones we care about. All right. We have, we're, we're gonna leave this one for our warm up on Thursday. Let's talk about distillation for a minute um, because that's what we're doing in lab today. We're not obviously going to set up a a um, petroleum refinery in lab today, but it's the same general principle. So a petroleum refinery, so distillation works by basically taking into a, or um, making use of the fact that of that equilibrium constant due to a phase change. If you have a phase change happening, so every time. If you have a phase change happening, like say it's butane, that's a four, not an H. What's the equilibrium expression going to look like um, in terms of KP? What's the first rule of equilibrium? Products of reactants. Products of reactants. What's the third rule of equilibrium? Only gases and only beans. gases. Only no gases liquids. or solutions. No liquids, no solids. So KP is in this case is just pressure of butane. 
as you increase temperature, K is going to go up. And you're going to get, and if you have a different delta H of vaporization for two different solvents, let's say we have this mixed with water, as we increase the temperature, the water is going to start evaporating too. But the rate that the water starts evaporating is going to be different than the rate that the butane evaporates because they have a different enthalpy of vaporization. Different delta H. Different delta H, so they're going to have different Ks. And so the boiling point of a salt of any liquid is when your pressure of that liquid at that temperature is equal to atmospheric pressure. And so we have lower atmospheric pressure here, so it doesn't take as much energy to boil water. Water boils at about 92, 94 Celsius here instead of 100 Celsius. And that's because we, we don't have to get that atmosphere, that pressure as high, that vapor pressure as high. So if we have this mixture and we're looking at the vapor pressure above the liquid, whatever has the lower enthalpy of vaporization is gonna have a higher mole fraction in that vapor phase. You're still gonna have a mixture of your total pressure above the, um, above the liquid mixture. It's gonna be still gonna be water plus butane. But you need to get that pressure to equal that P total. And if we can get the, the pressure of these together to equal P total of the atmosphere, we wind up with our mixture boiling. But the mole fraction of these in the vapor phase is not the same as the mole fraction that it was when they were mixed together as a liquid because they have different enthalpy of vaporization. Whatever has the lower enthalpy of vaporization is going to be overrepresented in your vapor phase relative to the mole fraction of the original mixture. So that's the whole idea of distillation is if you have two different liquids as a mixture, if you boil that, the vapor phase is going to have extra of whichever one boils at a lower temperature. And so then if we can collect that gas, we wind up sort of enriching that mixture with whatever boils at the lower temperature. That's all a distillation is, is making use of the fact that you're going to have two different vapor pressures. And if the butane has a, has a higher vapor pressure, you're going to have more butane. If you started with it 50-50, after one distillation, it might be 70% butane and 30% water. If you do it again, you get that same rate, different ratio above, and now you might wind up with it being 90% butane and 10% water. It's not actually linear like that. It asymptotically approaches 100. So it's just whichever one has like a different delta H for vaporization. Right. Kind of just dips off exactly and just left with a different mole ratio exactly exactly and so that's that's the whole point with this and the closer your your um vaporization points closer your enthalpy of the vaporization the less effective distillation is right because if they had the same exact enthalpy of vaporization you're not really doing much you're going to get the same function you're going to get the same mixture above as you had in the in the bottom phase. No matter how many times you try to do it, it's still going to have the same. Okay, exactly. You still have a limit that it's approaching to in terms of how much you right. can really vaporize off. Exactly. And so the, the distillation is not always the best way to separate things out, but it's a really useful way because everything is going to have at least a slightly different enthalpy of vaporization. So you can at least get something. Yes. Is there an example of two liquids mixing together to provide different boiling points as far as the intermolecular forces of the two liquids? Well, you wouldn't think of it as a mixture then, you think of it as the solvent and a solute. As soon as they're not 50-50 in terms of molarity, then you wind up with your, your boiling point elevation from the back to negative properties, right? <laughs> Antifreeze is one. Antifreeze, exactly. Um, times molality, right? Moles, solute. Over kilograms. Over kilograms. I'm oh, sorry. 
solvent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this works as long as it's what's called an ideal solution, which nothing is. Right. An ideal solution means that you can basically treat it like it's going to be a linear, uh, a linear combination of the two, the two which boiler points. Never. There are very few. In the most common example we do for distillation is ethanol and water. And ethanol and water actually hit a point where they make what's called an azeotrope, where you can't actually use distillation to get it past about 95% ethanol. When you get to 95% ethanol, and then you distill it again, you actually wind up with the same fraction of ethanol to water in the vapor phase as in the liquid phase. And so you can keep going infinitely, and you'll never make it past that. P total. It does. It comes back to that and the difference in enthalpy. The difference in the um, and it gets to the point though where yeah, if you just get the same thing out you put in, and yeah. that's why Everclear is ninety five percent pure and nothing more. It doesn't matter how much you look; you can't, can't buy can't drinking can't alcohol more. more than that, because the only way to get more to get rid of more water than that is to use drying agents, uh, well, which we use. Then at that point, you're kind of just like denatured alcohol, right? So denatured. No, denature oh, wow. actually takes that 95% and just adds some methanol to it. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> just to make it so it'll poison you. It doesn't actually. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> um, you're contaminating on purpose to render it unable to drink it. Yeah. Um, if you want to get more pure than 95%, you basically have to go to a chemical supplier. You can get stuff. We have alcohol that's more pure than 95%. Shuts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it is very, very expensive yeah. because you have to, you can't just distill your way all the way. So applying this concept to like melting points of solids, having the two melting points or having the two solids together gives you a significant like lower melting point. You won't see that in any kind of mixture of liquids. With, so if you have a mixture of liquids and you're talking about boiling points, you'll actually get something close to a weighted average between the two boiling points. And the weights are the mole fractions in the upper liquid phase. Gotcha. Um, and, that, and that's why you wind up hitting that point where K is the same is because if you make, if you get the temperature just right, you wind up with the vapor, with the mole fraction times the vapor, the vapor pressure of both liquids being the same. And so that's why you get the same makeup in the in the gas phase as you had in the liquid phase. But it comes back to this and e to the negative delta g over R T and those different delta g values. And so in lab today, we're going to set up a distillation. We're going to show you the way that we go past the distillation, um, which is using we're going to use a GC a gas chromatogram which is basically a fancy way to do a distillation um, where you don't actually get a sample out of you. You just get a reading of what the makeup is. is. Right. Um, so I'll have those printed, printed out for you on that one where you can come down and get a, a um, printed copy down in my office right now. Um, and there should be enough downtime for you to get some melting points too from last week's slide. Get some of that knocked out because we'll, you're going to set up your glassware and then wait and watch it boil for a while. So you can do a melting point every time you do that. Okay. All right. I'll see everybody at one or down in my office if you have questions before that.